Okay, so let's start today. Identity. I am a child of God. Say that after me. I am a child of God. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. How you see yourself and what you believe about yourself will impact how you live and how you relate to other people. So let me ask you a question. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself the way God sees you? What do you believe about yourself? Quite honestly, who are you? (laughs) Now, behind discovering our identity, and I'm going to repeat this over and over again through this message, uh, it's a thought that I'm going to revisit. It's like hammering the same nail on the head, just so that we get this into us. And that is that defining your identity is not about what you do, It's about who you are. So we're going to look at three things from this. The first is let's take a very practical look about how do most people define who they are. Most people define their identity in in a number of different ways, actually, and they're all correct. Nothing wrong with any of these. But probably the single most reason of how people identify themselves is their face. <laughs> I mean, you are what you look like, right? I remember, I remember going to preach in Ireland one time, and I was, it was in the south of Ireland, and uh, they, they had prepared a leaflet, a flyer, to advertise these meetings for the weekend, and they'd got my bio and my photograph, and they put it on the front there, and and I walked into this, this uh, town in Wexford, right in the south of, of Ireland. And I walked into the church, and, and, and the, 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 the steward on the door brought me, and she said, Oh, Phil, don't you look like yourself? <laughs> <laughs> your identity is what you look like. You, your passport or your driving license has your photograph on it. That's how you are identified. We recognize people because we remember what they look like. (laughs) Interestingly, if you haven't seen somebody for a long time and they've changed their appearance, they they are foreign to you, right? How many times have you seen somebody after a while and they've changed the color of their hair or they've lost weight? Well, I never recognized you. (laughs) Their name. We recognize people by their name. You recognize an author of a book by his or her name. I have well over 2,000 books in my library. And when I look through the reference and try to find a book, yes, there are some books that I pick out because I know the title of it. But more often than not, it's because of the author. We were traveling back from the airport, Yvonne and I, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we stopped at the services to get a coffee. And we walked into the uh, t- into the W.H. Smith's, it was, and... and uh, I was waiting for Yvonne, I was just glancing through the bookshelves and Yvonne came and said, oh, oh, where's the latest Tess Gerritsen book? I need to see it. She she was trying to find the latest book based on the author's name. Your surname is how you are identified. A person's surname actually identifies which family they come from. Oh, it's one of the Jenkinsons or one of the Parkinsons or, or one of the Spiveys or one of the Coopers or whatever. Okay, we identified by name, identified by gender, male or female. Sadly, increasingly these days, many people are becoming confused by their identity because of transgender issues. And those people continue to struggle on the one issue about finding out who they are. People's ethnicity or religious group. I'm a Nigerian. Where's Salome? (laughs) I'm a Buddhist or whatever. By their social status, I'm a leader. I'm a businessman. By their experiences, by their hurts, their failures of the past and the difficulties that they face in life, very often determines who they are. And they identify themselves with their failures. I've often heard people say, I'm a failure. I'm hopeless. I'm no good. 
What a shame when that happens, actually. How tragic it is when that takes place because of what other people have said about them, especially as a child. You know, we need to be very careful what we speak to our children. Some of the things we establish in the lives of our kids live on for the rest of their lives. We as parents need particularly to be very careful what we say to our kids. Never ever say to your child, you're useless, you are. You're hopeless. You'll never make anything. You're good for nothing. Those are statements we need to rule out of our conversation. We need to do other things. You are great. You can do this. You're a man that God wants to raise up. Those are the things we need to establish in the lives of our children. And so those people that are bound by their circumstances actually are exalting themselves rather than Jesus. And any life without Christ tends to do that actually. And other people identify themselves by their performance. What I do gives my identity. I'm going to expand that in a minute or two. And all these examples of what I've just run through are different ways in which people identify themselves. Now let me reiterate that statement once again. We are not determined by what we do, but by who we are. God has called you to have dominion in life to know who you are. Well, that's all very well, but how do we do that then? How do we know our identity in God? Well, the next thing that I want to to move on to, and this is absolutely key, is that our identity in God comes by revelation. That's what Jesus was saying in his conversation to Nicodemus in John 3. Now let's take a look at Jesus' example. I found this really fascinating as I explored this. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in Matthew 3, the first thing he did was he was baptized. He was baptized, then he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. But it all started at his baptism. And it was John the Baptist that baptized Jesus. And I want to communicate to you today that it was Jesus' identity was redefined and made clear at his baptism. You know, water baptism is more than a ritual we offer here. It's more than that. It's through baptism that something is ignited in a Christian's life that brings a new identity. At water baptism, the type is clear, showing that we, when we go under the water, we are repenting to the old life, and when we come up out of the water, it means that we are identifying with the new life. We rise a new person, walking in God, being born again into this God-filled, exciting, exhilarating, thrilling, powerful life. Now, <clears throat> let me make it clear. We don't believe here in what is referred to as baptismal regeneration. That means that in order to a per- for a person to be born again, you've got to be baptized in water. No, that's not what we're saying. In fact, that isn't true. When you are born again, that's an operation of God by the Holy Spirit inside of you anyway. Okay? When Jesus died, rose from the dead, he went to the disciples and it said he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I believe that was the time when they were physically, literally born again. It was days later on the day of Pentecost that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That was a different experience. That's the way that I look at it anyway. However, this connected with water baptism, an identification process that when you come up out of the water, you're identifying with Jesus who was buried, rose three days later, and you're identifying with rising in newness of life after Jesus. So here at John's baptism, John 1.29, John the Baptist said this. He said, Introducing Jesus for the first time, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus' baptism identified himself with the Father and with the Father's purposes in his life. So water baptism is the end of a former life, rising with a new identity to begin a new life. Before his baptism, Jesus was known as the son of Joseph and Mary, the carpenter. Right? 
But then the dynamic words of, G, of John came to Jesus, and it actually was a revelation of John, that John had in declaring Jesus' identity. The Bible actually tells us that Jesus needed to be baptized to fulfill what was right with God. And so Jesus' old life, his life up to that point as a carpenter, was changed to a new life as the Son of God. This was a revelation that came. Now actually I believe that revelation can come progressively. I think Jesus already knew through studying the scriptures and through reading that there was a specific call on his life. Do you remember at the age of 12 when he was found in the temple and uh, he was there for three days, isn't that interesting, another three day period, Joseph and Mary kind of lost him. I always smile at the thought of how can you lose the Son of God for three days, but anyway, they found him in the temple and, um, and when they discovered him, Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees and uh, they said, well, what have you been doing? We've been looking for you. And he said, don't you know I'm about my father's business? So there was a progressive understanding of who Jesus was. But it was here at his baptism that the full declaration of Jesus being the son of God was made clear. In fact, in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says this, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment... Heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. This was a personal word from the Father that defined Jesus' identity as the Son of God. So I said before, just in case you haven't got it yet, here's the nail coming being hit by that same hammer again. What defines your identity is not what you do, but who you are. Now, why am I saying that? Look at what happened after Jesus' baptism, immediately after what happened. He was led into the wilderness by Satan. And uh, Satan had this conversation with Jesus, and basically, to pray see what Satan said, he was saying this, he said, if you are the Son of God, then prove it. Do something. And the devil was looking at Jesus in the natural realm. He was not looking at Jesus as the Son of God. And in Matthew 12, 38 and 39, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the law. And uh, they were speaking to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. Do something. Prove what you are saying. And this is what he said. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none of them will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah, if you remember, was swallowed by the fish, we presume was a whale, and he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Here's those three days again, typifying when Jesus died on Calvary, was in the grave for three days. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And that was the miraculous sign that proved that he was the Son of God, but that was not of his own doing. That was what the Father did. So the cry constantly to Jesus is, if you're the Son of God, prove it. Do a miracle. What I am saying to you is your identity comes by a revelation from God. Some of you are sitting here today, may have heard this for the first time. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And you need to have a revelation that Jesus died for you to set you free, to give you eternal life. That you can join with singing the song that we did earlier to say, I am a child of God. But it first comes by revelation. (laughs) Your identity comes by that revelation of what Jesus has done in his redemptive work on the cross. People were constantly saying to Jesus all the way through his life, do something, prove your identity. Even at the cross, you know what they said to Jesus when he was hanging there on the cross? They said, if you are the Son of God, then come down off the cross. (laughs) In other words, do something spectacular. People will always want to attach you to what you do and not who you are in God. It's not what you do that defines you, it's who you are. 
That's your identity. I want to concentrate on this next point. Performance does not define your identity. Again, let's go back to Jesus' example. And it's seen very clearly from the temptations of Jesus in Matthew 4. Three times, Satan told Jesus to do something to prove his identity. And each time, he refused to perform a miracle. It's not what you do that defines your identity. It's who you are. What did he say? His answer to Satan was, I am who the Father says I am. (laughs) We can say, I am a child of God. Jesus said, you are my children. I am a child of God. Say it. I am a child of God. So he was constantly pressurized to establish his identity by performance, by works. In Luke 23, verses 8 and 9, it was the day of the crucifixion where he was brought before Pilate, Pontius Pilate. And Pilate was hoping to see a miracle. He said, perform a miracle, prove to me, then I'll believe. But what did Jesus do? Nothing. He stood there in silence. The Bible says, as a, as a lamb is done before his shearers, so Jesus opened not his mouth. Because why? Jesus was confident in who he was. He is the Son of God. Full stop. Why? Because the Father told him so. He didn't need to prove it. His identity was not secure by the things he did. His identity was secure because of who he was. So what performances do people often try to do to define their identity? Well, look, at I've I've written a list. There may well be others, but these are the things that came to me. There are some people who require constant affirmation. People like to be pleased. Oh, you're doing well. Oh, that's great. they, They want approval all the time. Affirmation. And that affirmation feeds their recognition of who they are, that they've been accepted. There are some people that can't handle feedback because they feel rejected. And when feedback comes, they, they, they feel as if they're rejected and so they react. Some people can't admit to guilt. Do you know anybody like that? Have you ever been like that? <laughs> They can't acknowledge failure because they think if they do, it will bruise their identity. In that video clip we saw saw right at the beginning, it talked about the whole fact that we will still stumble. We will still make mistakes. But that does not take away from the fact that I am a child of God. There are some people that are, are afraid to try new things. Why? Because of the fear of failure. Can I say this? You know, it's okay to fail sometimes. It's okay. We don't like it. We don't want to do it. But God doesn't throw you on the scrap heap because you've made a mistake. I am still a child of God. Your security is not in the things that don't work out. Come on, there are things that don't work out in life. We just hold our hands up and say, it didn't work. But I'm still a child of God of God there are some people that need to know all the rules before they do anything want to know all the rules beforehand because they want to feel in control if they're not in control they lose their identity there are some people that can't be spontaneous because they have to be in control because they always want to appear to be correct the fear of making a mistake some people that give out affection and approval only in a measured amount. You, you know, you, I'll, I'll, I'll give them approval. I'll say thanks. I'll encourage them. I'll love them and approve them if they deserve it. You know, something we don't deserve the love of God. Let's make that clear. We don't deserve eternal life. We don't deserve this fantastic life. But God loves us just the way we are. You know, this powerful understanding in the three words, God loves you. He loves you. Warts and all, mistakes and all, sin and all. God loves you. He loves you. 
just the way you are. There are some people who are bound because of a religious spirit thinking that I have to live in a certain way to please God. I have to be holy. I have to live my life this way. I have to be at all the meetings. I have to read my Bible every day. I have to pray every day. I have to do this. I have to do that. Otherwise, God won't love me anymore. All of those things that I've just mentioned are performance-based attitudes. And instead of those, we need to have the confidence in who we are in God. I am who I am because God says so. That's what Jesus did. I am the Son of God because the Father said so. Yes, you'll make mistakes, but you haven't grown up into the fullness of God yet. None of us have. But you're still his child. You need to say that I'm not a holy person, like God is holy, because I haven't grown up into the holiness of God yet, but he has made me holy. <laughs> it's not on what I have done. It's on who I am in God. Isn't that great? The natural man says, I am not holy. But it's the spiritual man says, I am holy because God says I am. <laughs> he says, he's presenting, Jesus is presenting to the Father a church holy and blameless, without spot, without wrinkle, without stain. <laughs> Fantastic. Living a life of true liberty is living with the attitude that you are confident and secure in who you are. And if your identity is based on your performance, then you are not looking at what God's done for you. Instead of that, look at what he has done. Jesus died to set you free. <laughs> he took the penalty of your mistakes, your wrongdoings, your past. And he's accepted you and he's adopted you as his child. Don't ever allow yourself to be bound by performance. If you do, you'll become religious. We don't like religious people in this church. <laughs> that might sound like a par paradox to some of you, but you know you hear what I'm saying? And if you have that kind of thinking, God has all these demands that I've got to live up to, then you're trying to strive to be perfect, to live a perfect life. Let me tell you now, you'll fail. You won't be able to do that. Be confident in who you are in God. I am a child of God. Our identity is not of works, it's a gift from God. So God has called you. He has chosen you. He has adopted you. God loves you not for what you do. He loves you for who you are. I can see three things that most people battle with in trying to define their identity. Unbelief, fear, and control. Let's have the band up. Unbelief, fear, and control. And we need to reject and repent of any of those areas that we have allowed into our thinking and become an action. You know, the root of unbelief says, I am unlovable. The root of fear says, I'm unacceptable. The root of control says, I need people to affirm me. Don't ever allow these things to enter into your thinking. God loves you. And he has accepted you and he affirms you. He has a destiny for you to live completely free of any rejection. You don't know Jesus personally. You're hearing this maybe for the first time. Or you may have heard it in the past, but the revelation hasn't hit you yet. Then what you need to do is call on the name of Jesus receive him as your savior because that's who he is and when you receive him as your savior you are born again <laughs> that part of you that was dead to God becomes alive again and you are released into a new life of freedom and acceptance and eternal joy and you are born again now to those of you who are already born again are you battling with your identity? Then recognize who you are in Christ. I am. I am 
a child of God. Remember, it's not what you do that defines you. It's who you are. I am a child of God. I stand. We're going to sing this song again. But just before we sing it, I'd like to I'd like to make an appeal today. You know, if you have never had that revelation come to you that Jesus died for you, he came to make himself known to you, to receive you to himself so that you can have this experience to be born again, you need to do that right now. You know, all you do is say, yes, Lord, I receive you. I receive you into my life. I accept that you died for me. I didn't understand it quite in this way before but look at all my past look at all my wrongdoings look at all the wrong things I've done he's saying forget all of that I've forgiven that just come to me and you will be born again close your eyes everybody please if that's you here this morning I just want you to raise your hand and slip it down again is there anybody here today in that situation because I want to pray with you bring you to the place of knowing yourself that you can, too can be a child of God. What about those of you that are already born again? You're struggling with your identity. You've struggled with understanding who you are. You felt rejected. You felt as if you're unloved and not accepted. Then raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? I want to set you free today by the power of the Spirit so that you can go home knowing that you are a child of God. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will overwhelm every one of us in this meeting with a sense of this wonderful destiny that you have called us, you have chosen us, you love us, and you are releasing us into a God-filled life that I am a child of God. Lord, I come against the work of the enemy who wants to undermine that. Our confidence is in the fact that you have said that we are born again. You have said that I am your child. And I pray, God, that everyone here in this meeting today will go home with the confidence of knowing who we are, that we are safe and secure in our identity in you. In Jesus' name.